Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is nine o'clock and it is time for a talk magic. And I have on the show today somebody I have so much respect for. He's freaking me out already. He is one of the most creative magicians in the UK, the Candyman himself, Steve Rowe. How are you doing? Hello, young guest, mate. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Was that good? That was great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the London bad Jack look with the, with the <laughs> I know, yeah, beard and everything. Yeah, this must be the lockdown dad look. We've both got extremely longer beards and the uh, yeah, the lumberjack. I've actually done my hair for this. I hope you appreciate that. I, I did mine as well. So uh... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't lead that question. <laughs> it, look, I know that you have been keeping yourself so busy during lockdown and. I know that you've got a lot on your plate and, and, and there's so much that you're doing, graphic design and, and a whole bunch of stuff that we'll get into. So thank you so much for finding the time to Pleasure. chat. Pleasure, Pleasure, yeah. I know what it's like with homeschooling and juggling everything else. It can be, uh, it can be this time is, consuming. This is a nice break. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know what? I, I, I referred to you when I introduced you as the Candyman and you really are because you're such a creative guy. And, and a lot of your routines, not all of them, but a lot of your creations are obviously centered around candy. And that's something that I really want to get into as to how we went down. Okay. That yeah, but yeah, yeah. Before we do any of that, for the people here that haven't heard of Steve Rowe, and if you haven't, what rock have you been living under? Let's start at the very beginning because you are a creator, a performer, an innovator. You have your own magic shop. You're one of the top performers in the whole of the UK. You're always busy. You're always in demand. Let's talk about Steve Rowe. Let's, maybe... let's finish there. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Tune in next week. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Um... When did the magic bug bite? What was your origin story, Steve? Was it your typical had a magic set for, for you? Or was, when... Yeah. Yes and no. Um, typically, when I was about seven or eight years old, I did get a magic set for Christmas and learnt, Paul Daniels one. And it's, it's actually off screen, but it's up there. I've still got it. Um, and I learned a few tricks from that and performed to family, basically, not even friends at that time, just family at Christmas and things. And just kind of because I watched the Paul Daniels magic show, I, I really loved learning things and um, being able to perform them. It wasn't necessarily about going out to lots of other people it was more just uh, something that I wanted to do for myself but what I, I discovered I, I liked the learning process so uh, I got myself some books from the library uh, again not from the library but some of the books here are, are ones from when I was a little kid and I like looking at the pictures and not necessarily reading so much but looking at the pictures and kind of making things as well I would I even back then when I was seven or eight I would I would sellotape <laughs> cards together to make them look like they were they were lots of cards. And then when you flipped it around, it was just one card. Simple little things like that, which were covered in sellotape and awful. But I would perform them to family and they would obviously be very kind and say that they loved it. So I, I kind of loved that whole, even when I was younger, I loved that whole process. But I, I stopped performing and, and doing magic probably when I was about 11 or 12 got into school secondary school none of my friends were really into it and I didn't know anybody else that was into magic and I kind of left it by the wayside until I was 39. You're joking. No there's a massive gap <laughs> yeah yeah so okay. I didn't get back into I, I, I didn't even think you were 39 now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I've been back into Let's magic go, properly. Go on. Some frame of reference here how old mm. are you now if you don't mind me asking? Uh, 49. So, yes, it was only 10 years ago mm. you decided yeah. to properly learn. I'm blown away. Yeah. It feels like you've been around in magic forever. I, I think really that's because it's been quite intense. I've kind of, which I'll explain in a minute. I, th I think that's the thing is I've been, yeah, I'm not, I, there's a big advantage to, to doing it. I've discovered the way that I've done it from having an interest when I was a kid to then having a gap because that gap allowed me to grow up, to have other interests, to learn other things. So then when I got into magic, talking to people, meeting people, which a lot of magicians have a problem with, is not a problem for me. The problem for me was the skills and the learning. Um, so when, and I know I was 39 because when 
and I'll tell you who influenced me as well, because I only found this out a couple of years ago. Interviews like this kind of, I started telling this story and then realized that I didn't know who it was that got me back into magic. Then I did a bit of uh, delving and found out. So I was at a christening 10 years ago and there was a magician there and I can't tell you exactly what he performed, which again is another interesting thing. Um, but I do remember I was with my friend and I do remember being absolutely blown away with him. I was like a giddy child again at this christening and he was he was performing magic tricks and it just absolutely blew me away. Now, I didn't stop going on about this guy. And so my girlfriend, uh, Kate, she bought me a Marvin's magic set, um, a standard box set, you know, not a big one. But, uh, the, the one that's got um, some really cool stuff in like the props are really well made. It's not like a what you'd call a kiddie's magic set. The executive kit, isn't it? It's a, yeah, it's really, where it had, really like, good. Dynamic coins and, and some really nicely it, made. That's what it had in it, dynamic coins. Yeah, so it's top quality props. Um, and she got me it as a joke. And this was at Christmas. And at that, at that Christmas, I learned the stuff and I was performing it to my own family. And, and you know, um, cousins and aunties and uncles were coming around and I, I was performing this stuff and I got the bug again. And, and from there on, the wonders of the internet, I, um, I started questioning, you know, I'm 39 now, am I too old to get into magic? And I joined a couple of magic forums. This Again, I think this was before Facebook and Facebook groups. Um, so I, I found a couple of magic forums which were discussing magic. Some were revealing some secrets, but so, it was ma mainly discover, uh, discussing magic. So uh, I asked a question on there, am I too old to get into magic? And I actually went back there on that forum a couple of years ago and answered myself, which is really cool. So I basically said, no, you're not, you're gonna do great things. Um, <laughs> and for me, I, 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 I found that I have done, you know, I, as you said before, you feel like I've been in magic a lot long, longer. Um, my learning curve is very, very steep, very fast, and I'm not afraid. Um, so after, as you said earlier, I'm a graphic designer. So after a couple of months of learning, I, um, I offered myself to a friend and I did some magic at their party. It was an 80th birthday party. And I was absolutely, I was absolutely petrified. I was in the car thinking, I've only been doing this a couple of months. I can't do this. I can't do this. And I got in there and because I, I guess because I knew them and I was, you know, already warm to them, started showing them some stuff and was getting some really good reactions. I'd learned some basic skills by then. I'd learned a, a double lift and I'd learned how to force and how to palm a card, that kind of thing, the basic stuff, which are still obviously used today. Um, and yeah, I, I fell in love with the performing side of it as, as well, right back then. And, and my friend said, you know, I think you've actually got something because he wasn't sure, like Steve, you know, his friend that he's known for years he's going to do some magic tricks and what's this going to be like kind of thing so he had faith in me and uh, yeah it paid off so I did, yeah fell in love with it so who was the magician that you saw that yes it was Richard Pinner oh well there's a great guy I mean you, you, yeah wow yeah so so what happened was I contacted the lady whose christening it was because obviously she's a family friend anyway and she said oh it was uh yeah let me have a look I think it was Pinner Entertainment so I messaged um Richard and he said oh well, let me have a look at my records and this is going back like eight years he looked into his records and said yes that was me <laughs> that's like, incredible so it's Richard Pinner that's really important because he he was I can't remember what he performed it was probably and he did some, I know he did sponge balls, which blew me away because I didn't know the secret. <laughs> Even then, I just didn't know the secret. And he blew me away with that. And, and he did some card tricks, but I can't remember. But I, I think that's important to note that it doesn't, if you can perform and you come across well and you can mingle with people, it doesn't really matter what you're performing, I don't think. That, that, that's not what, so I've experienced a magic performer from a layman's perspective, and then I'm analysing it as a magician now. Well, let me ask you a question, before we continue to move on the timeline, let me ask you a question about that. Mm. One thing, because I've seen you perform quite a lot, and as you know, I'm a huge fan of you. And one thing that I've seen that you do over and over again is you instantly get this sort of relationship with the people that you're performing for. Uh, do you know mm. what I mean? Instantly, you've got this connection. And a lot of magicians, they struggle with that. 
especially yeah. musicians. They they, mm. they focus on learning the slights and learning the moves and they perform and they can do it technically really well. And the stuff they're doing is very impressive, but it's almost like they're just performing to a mirror. They're not really building that relationship up with the people yep. they're performing for and getting that connection. Yeah. And, and you do that so well. You, you, you immediately, and I've seen you do it, you walk up to a group of people and within a second, they're your best friends. And that's something that I see so few people doing. Have you yeah. got advice on how you do that? Because I yeah, absolutely. I, absolutely. I mean, but like like anyone, I used to watch DVDs and, and I mean, I, I <laughs> would even put on an American accent after watching Greg Wilson. <laughs> Honestly, I would perform. I, I would at Dan Harlan. I would perform like Dan Harlan. This was this was to, to my girlfriend and to my friends. And they'd be like, why are you putting on that really weird voice? Or why are you acting like that? This isn't you. And I'm like, well, you know, I didn't know any better. Um, this, this is this is how magicians are. I don't know, and, and so I am guilty of that myself until I met Kieran, Kieran Johnson at the time, Kieran Lefevre. Now he um, he taught me that it's okay to be yourself when you're performing. Just be be yourself, be an exaggerated version of yourself. But that is is what you need to be. And because I am now an exaggerated version of myself, I'm comfortable with myself and I'm comfortable walking up to a group of strangers and talking to them for two minutes before I've even shown them any magic because again I was talking about the, the break from being a, a child to an adult I, you know I'm already okay with with talking to people I, I, th I think one of the things that I saw that Kieran did um, in the chaotic DVD which really struck a chord was he was performing sat down on a on a chair with people so he went to the people, they were at a table and he sat down with them and he performed with them and he was with them. He wasn't performing at them or to them. He was, he was in there with them. And, and that taught me a hell of a lot that it's okay to be who you are and it's okay. You don't have to have this bravado and this strange persona that you put on because you think you've got to be like other people. So because I'm comfortable with myself and I'm an exaggerated version of myself i'm comfortable in any environment and so yeah that that's that would be my my advice be yourself learn to be yourself that's really good advice that is brilliant advice um so you've got back into magic you've watched richard mm. the the spark has been ignited fast yeah. forward two months you've gone and done your first gig <laughs> yeah which is crazy, but there you go. I love that. I love that. that, that <laughs> it was you. literally, it was literally a couple of months. And uh, as I said, because I'm a graphic designer, I, I, um, and my, it was for my friend. I got him to take pictures for me, and I had a website, business card, everything within within three months. I was looking like I'd been doing it years. So that was going to be my next question. When did you, did because I know that obviously for a long time you've been professional obviously over lockdown you've spent a bit more time doing graphic design out of necessity mm. because it's been difficult to perform yeah but yeah. for as long as i've known you the graphic design has been sort of here while the yes. magic has been here it's always absolutely been magic, yeah. a bit of graphic design on the side when did you make that shift from so you've gone out you've done your first gig you've set up a website you've set up business cards was mm. an immediate jump in the I'm going to now start performing full time or was it a gradual thing that built up? It was a gradual thing that built up and kind of, yeah, it started to get busier and busier with parties uh, and then weddings and yeah, just found myself every weekend uh, busy. Uh, so it was just a gradual thing. And then the graphic design, I still do it. I still do it now. Um, but it is, yeah, it's very much, it's, it's very much gone like that, which I didn't expect because I, I trained to be a graphic designer. Mm. So have you got any advice that you could give on, let's just assume that the apocalypse isn't going to happen and that we're not going to turn into an episode of The Walking Dead and at some point down the line, things are going to get back to normal. Um, mm. Have you got any advice for people that are new into magic that want to make a career out of it? Because that's the question that a lot of people have, isn't it? When am I going to go full time? That's something that you do yeah. very early on. How mm. do you juggle having a full time job, in, in your case, design, and build up this 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 magic business. And when do you kind of go? Well, well, now I'm going to focus. Do you know what I mean? How how did you approach? Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. It, and I will say it is important. Although I'd only been into magic back again for a couple of months, I had learned 
some basic skills, um, really intense learning, which is really easy on, on the internet, isn't it? And, you know, I rewatched Dynamo episodes <laughs> and David Blaine episodes and was going, oh my Lord, it, it, it broke me when I realized what a double lift could do. It just broke me completely because I know the feeling I had watching those shows before I knew what a double lift was. And, and, and I will say that there's some real simple slights that you can learn if you master them, you can do so many things with them. So it's important obviously to, to learn the craft, to, to get good at stuff. Uh, I wouldn't say go out there straight away and, and perform. Um, I managed to do it because I was using some basic things that I'd learned quite well and I had a bit of uh, confidence. Um, but in, in terms of, um, moving towards full time i think it, yeah it's got to be a gradual thing and you'll know when the time is right when you can't really be bothered to get up and do the other stuff uh, and when you're super excited to do the stuff that you're doing in the evening or at the weekend um and when financially it obviously depends on your financial situation i've got a, a mortgage i've got a family so it's not sort of thing i could go i want to do magic now and it's like well i've got three gigs this weekend and i've got four next weekend but that financially unless it's you know, two years in advance, that financially isn't going to suffice for me to go, right, I'm going to stop now and, and just do magic. So everybody's different, but I think you, you will know. You get to a breaking point. You get to a point where you're working your absolute butt off um, and something's got to give. Okay, that's really good advice. Again, that's great advice. Now, when did you start creating magic? Because obviously the other thing mm. that you're known for is as a creator of magic and creating really innovative, out off the wall stuff that nobody had ever seen before. Mm. Uh, a lot of it is chocolate and candy based, at least it was when you first started. Yeah, yeah. I remember buying Life is a Box of Chocolates years ago and mm. you were kind of doing design, you're offering design because obviously it's a thing that has to get printed, and I think it was yeah. you were you were offering you were offering that service. And was yeah. that the first chocolate-related thing that you were exposed to? Uh, had you started creating magic at that point, or uh, no? I hadn't. I don't think I started. Yeah, Michael came to me because I, why was it? I think through various forums, somebody had said that I was a graphic designer uh, and could do some work, and, and and it kind of took off. And then Michael contacted me for his cards. And um, that probably was the first chocolate related thing that I was involved in. But early on, I, I talked about Greg Wilson, but there was, um, I, I like props. I like, you know, I like holding things. I, I'm really turned on by things visually that, that change. Uh, and even before that, before meeting Kieran and working with lollipops and, and chocolate, um, there was, uh, there was a, a product called Sticky. I don't know if you remember Sticky. I'm trying to think who it was by. Um, and Jose Lequest did a, a product called Strip. Do you remember Strip? The, I... Lister the Listerine box where yep. it was a tiny box of Listerine and a card would appear. I do remember. Card that. corner would appear. Um, uh, Ke Ke oh, the, uh, the, the Sticky was Kevin someone. I can't, can't remember. You might need to Google that. <laughs> but I was already turned on by organic things um, because I personally wanted to perform. I didn't want to do kind of the classical stuff. I wanted to do something different that worked with my character and worked with me. If I'm down the pub with friends and showing them magic, I want to be able to show them something that's out of my pocket that looks real. So I was already turned on by organic things and it kind of just snowballed from there. Um, the first thing that I ever invented, I think, was the breakaway Sharpie, which isn't sweet related. Oh, but that's such a bloody amazing <laughs> trick. Um, it's so good. For well, it, but why, why it wasn't invented before, I haven't got a clue. And, and we, we might touch on this a bit later on how um, one of the, the benefits I've got of having a big gap from magic is, is that I'm not afraid to try things that have already been done. Yeah. Um, and I think that's important in a creative process to too many people are kind of ah, someone's done that. So I can't I can't do that. Well, you, you can you can still invent and try something, not necessarily to produce to sell, but for yourself. I think there's no harm in, in looking at 
various props and making them more for your own. And um, yeah, I, I was, uh, I mean, I've got it here. I, I, used to, I used to actually perform with one of these in close up. <laughs> okay, that's cool. Honestly, in close up, because I, again, I think we forget as magicians the impact of, that things have. This is a really awesome prop. It's awesome because it breaks the ice and it makes people laugh. And that, that is perfect. Um, I know it's a kid's prop, which is why I then went onto the, the Sharpie, but I used to bring that out of my pocket and get people to hold onto it. And adults laugh. Yep. But immediately you're breaking the ice when you're performing. You're not saying, look, hold on to this deck of cards. You kind of bring that out, hold on to it. And it's like, yeah, this guy's not taking himself too seriously. We're gonna have a bit of fun here. So I used to use that, but it, as I got more and more um, props that I was holding on to, bringing that out of your pocket and it kind of doing all this, and the fact that it was a bit of a cliche item, I did want to move a little bit more away from. So um, just, it's weird how creation works. Sometimes it's out of necessity, you want to do something, and sometimes it just, it just something comes. And I thought, I want to create something like that. What can I create um, that has a similar effect? What do we all use? And we all use a Sharpie. So I, I created the, the breakaway Sharpie, which is which is this version. So <laughs> there's there's the Sharpie, you hand it to somebody and it breaks. It's it has exactly the same effect when you're performing as the breakaway one does, but it's a natural prop that the spectator has is used to. And they when they grab hold of it, it makes the whole group laugh. And I absolutely love that. And I think so that, that was. That's and that's some, not sweet related. No, <laughs> but that's something that is another thing that I think characterizes you, which is for you, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm making a statement here, but I mm. think from watching you, the magic is secondary. Primary yeah. importance is the entertainment. And a uh, lot yeah. of stuff that you, I, I remember buying off you, and I still use it to this day, the thing with a mirror on a telescope. <laughs> yeah. and it's kind of like right pick a card don't let me see it i'm going to turn around and then you telescope this thing and, that's what we're see. and they all know you're joking yeah but yeah yeah it's such a funny moment but your 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 serious magician would look at the breakaway sharpie and something like that and they'd go what what but for you entertainment is paramount would, would you agree I, with I, that yeah I, I, absolutely i i think um so what you you were talking we'll talk about character in a, a bit later on but um Chris Wood said something interesting to me. I, I said to him, I didn't think I had a character. And he said, you absolutely do. You are, when you perform, you are a boy who's excited about what you're, you're doing. And that, that's it. I think it, I perform because I love it. I love the reaction that I get from people, but I also love magic. And I think that enthusiasm because I love the magic. It's almost like even when I do stuff, I still see it through the eyes of someone that doesn't know how I'm doing it. Yeah. It's a very, it's a difficult thing to explain, but <laughs> I can put myself in their position and then I get excited and I get shocked as well. It's, it's a really strange thing. Yeah. So, so for me, it is very much about having fun and I break the ice with things like this. I mean, just, just that, e even just using this prop within your card routine. So you get them to sign a card and they take that. It just does. It just, really breaks the ice um but i want to talk quickly about um creating this and, and, and making this because it's an interesting thing that people that want to get into creating might be interested in this sort of thing doesn't just happen um the idea just happened i knew i wanted to to make this and i came up with this but the process of coming up with this is laborious <laughs> it took so many versions of different designs to get to something that worked, okay? Um, I knew I wanted a Sharpie that broke into six pieces and I knew that if I pulled it, I wanted it to look straight. Um, the first one I ever did was awful. <laughs> it's just, just, it's a kind of a piece of cord inside the bits of Sharpie, didn't really work. And um, the next one I did, I thought, well, okay, I need black cord. And again, it, it didn't didn't really, really work. I then started to, to look at the, the the way that the um the breakaway wand is is built you know with a male and a female part i started thinking about beads and uh yeah it, it doesn't really work um but mm. what do you think i mean I, you might even know this because we, we we were both on the chaotic forum um but what, what do you think magicians say when you present a magician that 
What, what do you think that they say? I can imagine they say that that won't work because it, it doesn't say Sharpie. Yeah, exactly it, that. They say, yeah. look, everyone's going to notice that. It doesn't say Sharpie. It's all mixed up. This is a really bad prop. So being naive and listening to that, I then went away. Now imagine, imagine um, <laughs> so only a magician would cut a Sharpie into six pieces and then try and put it back together again. And <laughs> I had a version of this where I basically got it um, so that it would line up better. So I cut it, I cut it and I put a rod so it would line up a little bit better and it kind of would look like that when you pulled it. Okay. I can't find the actual version right now. Oh, there it is. Yeah, okay, so think of how I've built this. Right? I've cut this in six pieces. I then hot glued the center and put two small rods in each section. And I've then got two pieces of string so that when I pull it, it looks more like Sharpie. Yeah. Com complete waste of time and utter nonsense. It just absolutely doesn't matter at all. As soon as you start performing this, and you hand a spectator that because I'm treating it like it is. It's just a pen and I'm just handing the pen. Sometimes I look away when I'm doing it. They don't look at it as anything but. And that's what I love about magic with organic props is that I don't want to use the phrase get away with because that, that's I don't want to disrespect the audience, but they don't look. I'm managing it. I'm not going take a look at this sharp. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on to the shopper. I'm just that, handing it to them. You are right. And I think that's such an important um, thing that magicians need to learn. Like, I mm. do a lot with the Omni Sharpie, as mm. you know. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, I've got I it. Literally, yeah. I will literally have them sign a card with a normal Sharpie, and I'll have the Omni Sharpie with just a normal pen lid on. I'll do a switch and I'll say, Hold on to that for a minute. And they're holding on to it for like five minutes, and nobody knows. Don't notice. Holding no completely see-through sharpie and then when the deck turns into a see-through block and then they look back and i'm like what about the pen they freak out because they've been holding yeah. it for five minutes but but that, that, that's because of the way that you frame the magic and again that's really important Ma magic is all about framing and, and and the beats of magic and making sure that the spectator looks and uh, does something when you want them to so you're directing them because the way that you're framing that piece of magic so the way that i'm framing this is i'm just handing it to them i'm not taking any focus to it at all even when the spectator does that i don't take any focus to it at all I'll go, oh, sorry I'll, I'll i'll fix it again and i do this hand it to them they fall for it again <laughs> and i then get out uh, my fruit pastel pen as, as a secondary <laughs> so, which is a sweet pen which is a really strange thing to have invented and one of my uh, most popular pieces really really odd <laughs> you're the only person i know that could that could come up you know I, I, it's amazing i've got one and i know lots of magicians that use it because it's such a random thing sign this card what <laughs> and, and interestingly you said earlier on you would never get a serious magician taking one of these props the amount of serious magicians that have actually got the fruit pen is incredible. You wouldn't expect them to, but they've got it because it adds that little moment, just that little moment, just by handing them something that isn't a pen. And you know what? Filling dead time is such mm. an important part of being a close-up magician because if yeah. you're not careful, there is a lot of dead time. You can yeah. very easily go sign this card, and in that 20-second period, nobody's. It's boring. No, if, if you don't yeah. figure out a exactly. Way, to fill that time and a lot of the stuff that you're talking about here there is no dead time when steve rowe is performing there is no dead time mm, yeah it's something crazy going on and and that's something that i think people yeah remember. yeah so. yeah and, and and also again an influence from kieran is that I, I like to to perform like magic is happening around me as well so things are happening and I, i'm almost shocked by it you know and just kind of you know moving around the moments as, as it were um but uh, do you want me to should I talk about the 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 idea behind this? I'd love you to, yeah, yeah, because it, it's it's an interesting thing. The way that I create magic is, is there's no set way. Sometimes I have an idea and I think it will work, and it doesn't. Sometimes I really want to do something and it does work, and sometimes like the breakaway sharpie, just straight away. But it's a lot of development work, yeah. making it work. Um, but the fruit pastel pen is a is a really interesting thing because it took me by surprise it was never invented as anything other than a prop on stage i, I, I entered the 
Watford Association of Magicians Wham um, stage competition as Willy Wonka. <laughs> so I had the hat, I had I had the blazer, and my whole routine was was chocolate based um, and sweet based, and uh, I ended up with a, a chop cup routine with a chocolate cup uh, and a um, uh, everlasting gobstopper, and I ate the cup. Uh, and I actually used that for my magic circle exam as well, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so the whole routine was based around Willy Wonka. And I was just looking at ways to make the props look like sweets because Willy Wonka, the wallpaper, you lick it, you know, um, the, the flowers, you eat them. Uh, I, I wanted to bring that into, into my act and have a, a theme running through. I don't professionally, I don't go out as Willy Wonka at all, um, but there's a heavy influence on the sweet side of things. So um, I, had a, I had a lighter and I, I wrapped it in, um, it's not very ethical when you think about it, I wrapped it in a sweet wrapper, a Mao Am wrapper, so it looked like Mao Ams, and then I opened it and I lit it. Uh, and I had, uh, <laughs> I had this as well, so the fruit pastel pen. Now, I wasn't looking for anything, this just came to me. I was literally buying a Sharpie marker at the same time that I bought some fruit pastels for myself. They were on the counter at the time and I mm -hmm. thought, okay, that's exactly the same. I could wrap that in that and I've got myself something that looks like sweets and it's a pen and that was it. And I, and, I, and I used it, it was on the table, and I would um, pick it up and just say, could you sign, sign your card? Just like that, yeah? But that's, that got such a good reaction from everyone that was watching because it was a surprise. I realised, well, actually, that looks like fruit pastels. Why wouldn't it be fruit pastels? And it's a really quirky kind of Willy Wonka-esque moment where, no, it's a pen. It's a really strange thing. So I started using it in close-up without announcing anything to do with Willy Wonka. I'd put that in my top pocket and um, I would do the breakaway. So this, again, framing, this is exactly how I would perform it. I would do the breakaway Sharpie. They go to take it second time, the gag. And then I would look away and I would have a Sharpie in my pocket here and the fruit pastels as well. And I would go for the fruit pastels and hand it to them, looking away as if I haven't, seen that I'd done it so it's almost like a mistake on my part and I'd say sign your card and when I turn back everybody's laughing and they're looking and they the spectator handing this holding this looking at this still thinks it's a fruit pastels pen uh, sorry a fruit pastels it's, it, but it, because it is essentially but the only tell is the the line there um and I would say yes yes sign your card I'll just just pretend to sign your card and and again if you imagine I got a card here and they're they're standing there and they're actually doing this and so the the, the whole audience the group is just thinking what is that prat doing like what's it but he's playing along or she's playing along with me because i'm saying yes sign your card and, and they're doing this okay so the whole group is then in and i then take it and i say no no actually sign it <laughs> and it's like it's just that moment again creating these little moments and all that is is a is a pen wrapped in fruit pastels that's all it is it is it's not rocket science but it seems to be for me one of the best things i have ever created um and obviously you, you can do fruit gums you can do mentos and lots of different ones because they're all they're all the same sort of sweets um so yeah little little moments like that we, we talked about character earlier on a little bit all of these little things sort of inject my character as I'm performing rather than I'm Willy Wonka here we go sweet sweet sweets it's kind of all kind of yeah that makes sense it does and it's it's so it again shows that entertainment is paramount for you mm, absolutely yeah yeah Which, so important like i i use the fruit pastel pen as you know i bought like five of you um, <laughs> i originally used it just like you said i i actually use it as part of a trick now um, okay yeah what what i do is i come out and i go anybody want a fruit pastel and i've actually got some fruit pastels and i, mm. I take one out and eat it and i just put it on the side but as i put it on the side i, I switch it for the pen and uh, yep. and then i've got this thing where i've i've got i'm doing a trick with a cup uh, a coins across with a cup. This is in my parlor show, and I put the cup down there, 
and I take the uh, I take the pen and I, I apparently drop it into the cup and shake it. And when I tip it out, I've got a load of fruit pastels. <laughs> and then when I look over there, yeah. I look back at the fruit pastels, I open it up and it gets a great reaction. But and, and I've performed it differently as well. I've performed it as a piece of magic. I've performed it as a as a offbeat moment. And that imagine that that one idea has sparked you to come up with a couple of different routines. Other magicians do they? That, so other magicians they put a fruit pastel in the top here and they take it out and they eat it and then they hand it to someone and then it becomes the pen. So there's no switching involved. Lots of different ideas, all from from that, which essentially was a non idea. It was just a pen that I wrapped in in fruit pastels and and that that is what i love about creating magic if you if you don't if you don't have any barriers up about how or what to create with magic then lots of things can happen well where do you find your inspiration from because one of the big problems that people have when they're creating magic is finding that initial that initial spark do you do you have i mean how do you find inspiration do you sit there and try to come up with tricks or you know i mean you talked about it in that no case, like looking at something on a counter and it's like oh do you know what mm, i mean no no yeah I, I i i never try to come up with anything i never try to come up with anything that i think might be commercial for financial gain because there's no financial gain in creating magic as you know <laughs> um yeah. so I, I i create magic for myself um, it, I never look for an idea. Ideas just happen. So I might be performing and someone might say something and I'll think, ah, oh, right, okay. You know, you know, one of the spectators might say something and it will spark an idea from me and then I'll go away and think about that. Or I might like, like that on the counter, just all of a sudden saw it and it just, it just came to me that that made sense. Um, I might see something on, on TV. There's all everywhere. Just culture in general creates influence. Seeing other people performing stuff, and I think, actually, that's really cool, but I would try and do it this way. So I've, I've developed and created a lot of stuff that obviously I don't release because it's adaptations of other people's work, yeah. um, and I keep it for myself. But yeah. I think that's, again, I think that's really important. I think a lot of people say to, say to me, you know, oh, I wish I was creative. And I think everybody is creative. Everyone can create. I think the problem is people are too scared. Um, they're too scared of criticism. They're too scared of going wrong, it being a failure or, or whatever it might be. And, and they don't learn the tools. And I think you've just got to not worry about any of that and do it for the right reasons. If you're creating something, anything, a prop, a routine, anything, it should be for yourself. And if it's a really good idea, I mean, what tended to happen with me was I, I would share, you know, a, a photograph of a, of a breakaway Sharpie online and someone would say, oh, I'd like one of those. Could I, could I have one of those? Like, yeah, OK, if you want one, don't mind you using it. And then, and then, and then it would snowball. And that's when you start getting into the, the side of that. I've got a shop and lots of other products and I'm producing stuff on mass. But I think influence really, I adapt stuff and create stuff to help me in my performance, in my act. And I think that's what you should do. You should be doing it for yourself. And I think that's important, you know, all of the mm. stuff you release. On it. And let's just, before we go any further, I'm really glad we're talking about your products. Let's just put at the bottom of the screen right here. What's your shop uh, web URL? Uh, Thegimmickking.com. There you go. And it's all commercial routines you don't create anything if you couldn't do it in your own act. no that that's the thing everything that i create yeah and i, I think that's important all, all too often i see people creating stuff maybe not for commercial gains but popularity it just and it doesn't make sense that they're, they're just knocking stuff out and none of it works none of it makes sense and so for me everything i create it for myself I work it, I refine it, I come up with different routine ideas, I show people they might want one, and then it snowballs into potentially some stuff becomes a commercial product, as it were. Um, but yeah, I think that's important. I would never want to produce or sell somebody something that doesn't work, because it's their profession, it's their act that they're putting on the line, and, and I'm responsible for making sure that stuff that I give them doesn't come below par. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you've released so much great material. Let's um, talk about some of this. Like one of my favorite tricks that you've released, which is not sweet related at all, is your Rubik's Cube card. I mean, 
that's incredible uh, for somebody who works with Rubik's Cube. I think Cube, I've got it, yeah. That, I, what I, a great I, opener. What a great opener. <laughs> what an amazing opener. And then you can fr throw it up and down. Or, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, again, I, I didn't... I didn't create that, although I designed it and, and made it commercial. Adam Black, a great magician up in Scotland, um, I had a, a gift deck which had um, lots of pictures on, and one of them was a Rubik's Cube. Uh, and he nonchalantly said, wouldn't it be really awesome if you could make that cube solve itself? <laughs> and because I had already developed work with a certain type of gimmick, I don't know if we're talking about that, but... Yeah, but we, <laughs> certain, I mean, yeah. only magicians watch this, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, because because I'd already worked with a lot of flat related gimmicks and and built a lot of flat related gimmicks. It, it kind of just struck me that that it's a symmetrical um, thing, and that it would be really simple to build a flat into that and make it change. Um, and again, when creating, I think it's really important to lots of people are they're watching your channel, they're taking influences from from other online stuff. I think it's really important to chat to people and meet up with people, magic clubs, whatever it might be, that are like minded and take in, in you know take some inspiration from each other, share ideas, uh, and then you can you know create stuff that you know you know will be will be good. Absolutely. But yeah, it's a great, it's a great thing. It's, it's great on Zoom. Oh yeah. For, for me, I, I don't really do a lot of cube work at all. And I said to you earlier on, I, I learned to solve the cube and then forgot and learned and, and you know, I'm kind of halfway there now. But uh, with, with Zoom, with a, um, what I do with this is, is I have it in the, in the mixed up state and I have the cube in a, a mixed up state as well. And I say, watch the, watch the card. I'm gonna ma match the card to the cube. And then I, I kind of switch the cube as I throw this up. So they're watching the card and then the cube is solved as well. <laughs> I've got no skill whatsoever apart from doing that and obviously coming up with the idea. Um, and that's, a, that's another interesting thing. Magic, I, I don't see this talked about enough. There are so many facets to magic other than learning sleight of hand, being able to perform to people, being comfortable with people, uh, learning about timing, learning about beats in magic, learning about framing, all of this kind of thing, I think is just as important as learning sleight of hand. And I think it gets a little bit brushed to the side. Um, you know, when, when people are looking at stuff, like, oh yeah, his sleight of hand was really good, but he's a terrible performer, <laughs> or he's terrible timing, or terrible storytelling, but his sleight of hand was really good. It's like, they, I, I do get a little bit annoyed because because I'm relatively it's still 10 years, but my sleight of hand is is basic, definitely basic. But I, I rely on other skills in magic to make me a good performer and a good magician. And I think um, it's all too, too often people highlight that sleight of hand is the important part of magic. And I think there's so many other things that, that need to be addressed. You know what? I totally agree. Somebody asked me on the channel a little while ago, what's the best book that you've ever read when it comes to magic? And I was like, how to win friends and influence people. Because <laughs> yeah. you're going to become a much better, if you want to be a professional magician, you're going to get a much better, you're going to become much better and you're going to, you're going to make more money as a professional magician, yeah. knowing how to interact with people and win yeah. people over very quickly. Yeah. Both, both in terms of being at a gig, but also in terms of selling people over the phone. That's yeah. such an important skill, but to a mm. lot of people, they think that learning the perfect double lift is the be all end all. Mm. Not, you know, I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I'm okay. I'm not, I'm not a bad magician, but um, one thing that I'm good at is is being able to connect with people like yourself, and that's mm. such a valuable thing. Such a valuable thing. Yeah, it it is de definitely. Okay, and very quickly before we carry on talking about your products, because I do want to talk about something in particular. Uh, I just want to okay. get back to that question, that, 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 that statement that you made, I'm not going to let that go, about uh, the importance of finding uh, people to connect with and show each other magic. And, you know, yes. and I know that you are, you, you are a big ambassador of the magic circle. Uh, I know. Yeah, that, yeah. Love it there. Yeah. Which is great. Um, any advice on finding a magic club? Um, I mean, that, there's lots of magic clubs, obviously. I mean, just so you know, the audience for this channel uh, there's more Americans that watch this than people in the UK. So, um, you know, it just doesn't just have to be about the magic circle. I know that you, sure. 
you're very big on the magic circle, but have you got any advice about... The point I'm trying to make here is I speak to a lot of newer magicians mm. and they feel very lonely. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It yeah. can be a very uninviting place. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, that, that, that's why I was saying to, to find people and talk to them and in person, because people in person are very different to people online, very different. <laughs> but when going back to, to when I got into magic, um, bought a couple of tricks on eBay and I met up with a guy who lived down the road. Um, I'm not in touch with him now, but he lived down the road and I bought some stuff off of him. And he was, he said he was a professional magician at the time. And he advised me, he said, find yourself a magic club so you can meet up with magic people, uh, learn to palm a card, uh, get an invisible deck, get a ring flight of some sort, and you'll never need anything more. <laughs> He's, I think he's still right. <laughs> Although I've got products and I, I sell products and stuff. <laughs> I think it, it, if you can master just a handful of things, um, you can you can do great things with them. Um, but in terms of, of magic clubs, I mean, I've, I've lectured in magic clubs all over, all over the country. And what a nice bunch of people all magic clubs are. They're, they're all really friendly people. Um, the ones that aren't friendly, the ones that don't attend the magic <laughs> meets. But yeah. in terms of finding magic, I Googled, because uh, I, when I first started out, I didn't even imagine there was, so I went from um, not doing magic for 20 odd years to seeing uh, Richard Pinner, professional magician, and then thinking, okay, i have learned a couple of magic tricks, but now what, you know, what, what do I do? So this guy advising me to find a magic club. I was like, magic club? What, there's magic clubs? Well, we're just one magic club, surely, the magic circle. And it's like, no, there's, there's magic clubs everywhere. There are magic clubs everywhere. You just, if you Google, I'm sure you will find. I was very fortunate that I went along and met, um, I emailed Julie Carpenter at Watford uh, Association of Magicians, which is my, my other magic club apart from the magic circle. And I was introduced to a really great bunch of people there and very friendly. And it was just a place that I felt comfortable in. Watford has some of the, I mean, honestly, I've lectured in a lot of societies as well. I don't think there's many mm. magic clubs out there that have got the caliber of members mm. as Watford. Right. Yeah, God, it's, it's, it's yeah, I, I, through I, the I, ranks, I, it's had some greats, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I've obviously not been there for a while, but people like Andy mm. Gladwin and... Uh, uh, Dave, D Dave from Carl and Dave, and yep. John uh, Allen, John Allen, so Wayne many, Fox, yeah, Wayne. So many amazing performers are in that club. My God, mm. yeah, um, yeah. It's but just meeting like-minded people and being. I mean, again, first of all, I was I was quite shy because my skill level wasn't all that. But I quickly realised that at a magic club, you've got hobbyists, you've got people that are into magic but they don't even perform they don't even try they just like magic they like watching they like learning they'll have a little bit of a go but they're not interested at all in pursuing it any further um so you've got that that type of magician you've got the type of magician that's sort of semi-professional does a bit here and there at their friends parties and you've got professionals and you and you've got those that are absolutely full-time and you know rocking it all over the all over the world martin cox yeah. you know travels all over the world with his with his act so Joining a magic club, if you can find one, and I'm sure there is one near you, is is essential. I think in, in learning. I mean, I, and again, I learned very, very quickly um, what was right and what was wrong. Yeah. And I think when I when I joined Wham, I was quite different as well because I joined and and I wasn't afraid. I, I think I entered close up comp. I'd, I'd only been there a couple of months. <laughs> I didn't I didn't do very well, but I just entered it. I just because I thought. I've got nothing to lose, you know, why not? You know, it doesn't matter if I don't win. I'm not going to win against all these people, but I need to take a step and enter to understand the process, to get better at it, you know, to eventually, if I wanted to win, then potentially I had, I had that maybe as an option, you know, if I've performed well enough. It's just, ma magic clubs are great. They really are. Absolutely. Absolutely. And don't just try to replicate them with, with online forums because some of them, you know, can be so toxic, Magic Cafe. Oh. Some of them can be... <laughs> left there a long time ago. Yeah, it's yeah. Honestly, it's it's one hell of a place. And um, I am very much uh, a person that if if something's not agreeing with me, I don't waste my time. Time's precious. I just shut it off. I, I leave the group. I block the people. I just you know, I've fallen out with maybe two magicians in in the whole of ten years. Um, 
but I've fallen out with them as in I've just blocked them. Just not interested. That's the, life's too short to deal with negativity. I'm yeah, sorry. yeah, absolutely. Right. I want to talk about what is arguably your most iconic product. The one that everybody does, Lolly Hero. Okay. Because this, <laughs> I mean, you were doing a lot of lolly stuff, you know, obviously, Kieran, I'm, I'm assuming you and Kieran are still friends. I haven't. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, friends. absolutely. Yeah, we, so, we speak more or less every day. Yeah. So yeah. you and yeah, yeah. Kieran, obviously, to give people background, you spend a lot of time with Kieran in the early days and, and he yep. popularized the lollipop production with the flash paper and, and mm. took that concept and run with it. You had decks to force lollipops. I remember you having mm. a, a lollipop thing where the lollipop popped out of the card. You had this is a very, very early incarnation of it. Look at that. <laughs> and, and, and we'll go, we'll go back to that later if you want. But that's that's how I got into flat cars. But because um, I wasn't allowed to produce a lollipop with flash paper. Should you talk about that now? Let's talk about that now. That is, is is that all right? Okay, because yeah. that again is a that again is an invention through necessity, which I think lead, leads us nicely into talking about Kieran. So obviously, Kieran. Um, the lollipop flash production for me is one of the best pieces of magic there is. I know it's simple, um, but it's got fire. You produce something and you give it to the spectator. Again, that lesson from Kieran making props so that you, they're not props, they make, making items that you can give to a spectator for them to remember you by. It's just so important. And, and, and I, I leave my spectators with all sorts of things. If it's a signed card or, you know, in a nice envelope, or if it's a 21st century phantom, or if it's some sweets linked together, Ben Williams, Linko, if it's anything like that, if you can leave it with them, that moment of magic stays with them forever. Um, so that's why I love the lollipop production. But I, I was faced with uh, a bit of a predicament because I was performing at Moore Park, which I don't know if you know it, but it's a, a grand estate nearby. And uh, it's full of lots of really um, uh, expensive artwork. And I was told I wasn't allowed to use any water or any liquids or any fire. Uh, that's my act. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, okay, that's not great. So I had to, I, I could not not do a lolly production. I couldn't, I couldn't not do it. I had to do it. It was such a staple as an introduction. I mean, the, the way that I perform it now is um, with the, the flash um, raffle tickets in a bag. They take one, a light it, give them a lollipop back. It's just such a great intro. Um, so I, I knew I had to be able to produce a lollipop somehow. So I, it, I did it with a, a playing card. And th this gimmick is awful and it doesn't work. Okay, it's been used and abused so often. But I did it with a playing card and, and this is the, the card. So I, I printed a, can you see that? I printed a lollipop yep. on there. And the idea was that you would finger palm a lolly behind and then you would go like that and it would, oh, it nearly did it. It would disappear. <laughs> <laughs> that never works. <laughs> the amount of times I show people this. So I, um, and it's terrible. This isn't the, this isn't the one that I used in production, by the way. So yeah, so you think upon my lollipop and I would go like that and it would drop out. That worked again. That worked, yeah. <laughs> Available from the gimmick king. <laughs> so, so anyway, I did, I did that as an idea and I did a video of it. And I got so many magicians saying, oh my God, I really want one of those. I was like, no, you, you, um, you haven't seen the prop. I mean, look, look, look at the, the prop is awful. It doesn't, you wouldn't get away with it in a real environment at all. It was just for a video that I come up with as an idea. Okay. Um, but I started thinking about other ways that I could produce uh, a lollipop. And then the, uh, another way was with a card. And I, I quite quickly came up with the idea of a flap, but it was kind of, you would do that and then take the lollipop off. So you would fold the flap. Yeah. Up. And this was actually the one that I used in performance. OK, so that's just a flap that's not elasticated, um, but it's magnetized. So it shuts. And if right. I if I bend my fingers, it opens. Right. OK. So in timing, I can bend my fingers open and take the lollipop out like that and then it would shut. Right. OK, that's clever. So it's, it's kind of a flap. So at full speed, you don't see any of that happening. What you see is that yeah got it 
So it's effectively the same thing. It's a lolly production. Um, and I developed this card into uh, lots of different versions, different style magnets. When I'm building a prop, quite geeky really, but I, I, I build more than one and then I write down in my notebook what, um, what each one's made of. So there's, there's number, can you see that's number one, two. So they've all got numbers on them and they all refer to different strengths of magnets uh, and different elastic within the card to, and then and then in my book I'll do that so that if I'm creating something in the future with that method I can see which version was the best one which magnet size which elastic or whatever it might be and um, so yeah I, I, I developed lots and lots of different ones until I got to a flat version um, which was the elasticated flap and the elastic and then, flap is the one that you sell and that's the one that yeah you know, I that's, mean, that's, that's the one I sell. But you can do loads of elasticated flaps. You can do happy and then birthday. Wow. Do you sell that as well? No, no. These are just flaps. These, just, these are just <laughs> flap cards. You, you know the hug and kill, hug yeah. and kill premise. You can do a hug and kill card, and that, and that's where the the idea of that one came came on. The thing I love about this, if I can catch it, is you can throw it up and then it's solved. I love I love that. Um, and there's color changing cards, obviously, that's nothing new. But they, these are all these are all built with the same system, uh, flap system. So that that's sorry to die, die oh. press, but that's that's how the lolly production flap card came about because uh, through necessity, I, I I had to use a lollipop in my act. I couldn't not. So I invented a trick to be able to do it. <laughs> wow. And and but you you went to town with lollies, didn't you? Like you were coming up with fake yeah. lollies <laughs> for cards for card reveals and 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 so much stuff like you know card so, yeah lolly through notes. I mean, come on, that says it all. <laughs> <laughs> but again, again, the way that that was invented was through the chaotic forum. Um, we, we were talk, we were chatting away. Chaotic Forum was a forum that was uh, created by Kieran for lovers of his DVD, Chaotic. Everyone in there was creative and just bouncing ideas off each other. And there's some great names that have been, been and gone in that forum. And um, we were talking about John Cornelius and Sharpie Through. Beautiful, beautiful thing that I used to do. And uh, my friend Aaron Phillips. So again, he's, a, he's, I don't know if you know Aaron Phillips, but he's a super creative person, yeah. but he never actually comes to fruition with anything. He comes up with so many ideas. It's, it's incredible. I talk to him again on a daily basis. He comes up with so many ideas, one of the most creative people I know, and he never actually does anything with it. But I think he comes up with that and it's a creative release. It's a cathartic thing. It's out of his brain. He can think of the next thing. Um, but in chatting to him and, and um, we were talking about the, the pen through and he said, oh, what I do as a gag, I, I give um, a lollipop and a business card to my spectator and I, and I say, I'll do it with that. <laughs> and I said, well, why don't you make the lolly actually do that? <laughs> and myself and Lawrence Turner had a competition. We both said, right, I'm going to go and build a lolly through. So I literally went away within a couple of, I knew exactly what I wanted. So Lawrence's idea was different to mine. Lawrence's idea was to have the stick go through and pull out. Okay. Now I, I, I thought that that was a much more difficult build because you've got to get a magnet inside here. It's got to be a strong enough magnet to do the, the work. Um, and I just thought immediately that the most visual Think is that that yeah. is odd, really, really strange. But and so nice I went away and built like it. That the, the nice thing I like about your version is once you've stolen the gimmick, you can still flash the lollipop because of yeah, how, yeah. yeah, because of but the, so, yeah. This has been developed because <laughs> this is one of the first ones. Look how bad that looks! <laughs> and and this was a rubber ball, and K Kieran's dog must have had about ten of these. <laughs> and I, rem I remember seeing Kieran perform at the Magic Circle with this, and, and he, he he pulled it out, and this went bouncing down the stage. <laughs> but it's now it's now this. It's it just looks exactly like a lollipop. My friend Pete James, he 3D printed me 
the parts. That's great. Lovely idea from Kieran there, the subtlety of having the, the logo on that part. Again, because you talk to people, you get, you know, you get people giving you, giving you help and ideas. But being able to do that still looks yeah. like the lolly. It does. It really right before does. you do that, you know. Brilliant. So, and yeah, lo lots of lots of lollipops, um, which moves us on to the lolly hero. Which moves us on to lolly <laughs> hero. Put you on the map. That that before I mean, your your stuff was very niche, uh, and I think that people found out about you through mm. lectures and through reputation. Yeah, and you were very big in the UK, um, but people outside yeah. they didn't know you. And then you came up with Lolly Hero, and suddenly everybody is raving about this. And like, yeah, I, well, I think before that, a Pier Eight, which was the eight ball off the off the car box um, with Big Blind yeah. Media, that got a really strong following internationally. Do you still sell that? Because that's one of the best eight ball productions I've ever seen. I, I I do when I've got the the parts to make it, which <laughs> which we haven't at the moment. We're we're looking. Been talking to BBM recently, and we're looking at re-releasing it um, with a slightly different uh, card, and also available in blue, as well as red. Um, so that's something that's going to going to happen in the future. But yeah, it, it, again, being able to take an eight ball off off a deck, I think it was, and we got John Bannon's back in as well. It was such a visual thing and something different to to pull an item out of a card. I don't think had really been done. Um, before I started doing it with lollipops and sweets and things. Uh, and I got the inspiration from uh, David Stone's cell. You were, you were also, uh, you were also, was it Illusionist that you released the... Pop. Yeah, Pop was yeah. before eight, the Appear 8, actually. So that, that was, was the, the candy Ferrero off of the Roche. scratch card. Yeah, the, the Fair Rocher off of the scratch card. So that was probably the first thing that I, I did internationally. Appear 8 overtook that on sales. Um, probably threefold and then then i got a really good review from david and wayne on a pier eight as well which was which was lovely uh, and i think that really helped mm. no it is it, it's great but but then lolly hero how did that <laughs> yeah happen? how did because that's such a yeah all idea and you know Again. what there's so many virtual magicians that are doing that hell at the moment yeah. kieran's dominating tiktok by doing something yep. very similar um, yeah, yeah. Well, Kieran and I are working together closely so that he's got lots of options. I'll say that. <laughs> I've been watching because obviously the, the, the man, and it's yeah. like it's like every day is turning a lolly into something, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so again, without without chaotic forum and without speaking to other magicians, a lolly hero, no doubt, would would never be. Um, I can't claim that it was my idea at all. Uh, I ran with it and I created it and I, I went through the process of making it a commercial piece of magic. I went through the process of using what materials to use. Um, I had the links up with, with Murphy's and, and other people to, to make it as big as it is. But the actual invention is something that happened just by chance. And again, I was talking earlier on about magicians are too scared to do stuff. That could have been invented by probably 10 magicians before me who all saw it as a really, really strong piece of magic. There was a, um, a Chupa Chup um, commercial on YouTube that got a couple of million views. And it was, it was basically a, a, an old guy and he was chewing a lollipop in the form of this person that was in a market. So it was all kind of set up to, to look real. And he was handing this lollipop to this person. That was out there for a couple of years, and people kept messaging me and saying, um, "Have you seen this? This this is really good. I don't think it's a magic trick. I think it's just a commercial thing. You should do something with this." And I get so many people messaging me, "You should do something with this." Not, "I'm going to do something." I mean, I don't hold all credit to all sweet magic. It's not my thing. But so many people, you should do this. Is a great magic trick. This would be a great magic trick. You should do it. But I don't know how you can do it with somebody's face. It wouldn't work. You know, and they just couldn't get their head around how it could develop into anything but that. And I got so many people saying it to me. I thought, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to go out and, and see what I can do with it. And it just occurred to me immediately that you've got 21st century phantom out there. Yep. celebrity reveals which is incredible um but they're not 
when you when you look at a lollipop, then actually I can show, I can show you one that I've been working on. So, see if you can guess who this is. Okay. Uh, is it? Um, it's not Arnold Schwarzenegger, is it? No. Yeah, it's Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Okay, so yeah, 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 yeah. I've, I've picked him because that's a recognisable face, yeah. especially if you say Arnold Schwarzenegger, that's a recognisable face. But a lot of celebrities aren't that recognisable. No. <laughs> Could be a blob. Um, but what is recognisable, what everyone can relate to, are superheroes. So Batman with the ears, Superman. Uh, and the first one I made, actually, was Superman. And so I, I, I looked online about how to, to cast things and how to make things and different resins to use and all that kind of thing. And I made one and I encased it in um, an actual suite. So I had it in my mind that I was going to go to a gig with this encased in suite and stand there for two minutes chewing the suite off. And it was going to be a magic trick. And I was, <laughs> it's just not, it's not happening. So I, ha I, had, I had the figure and it, and it looked awesome. Uh, but the problem that I had was encasing the the head uh, within a suite. Um, and Alan Robinson came forward and said, "Look, I've got an idea. Take it. You know, run with it. Permission." And that was to to use the the head, the round head. So you effectively show somebody a round head. You can then put it in your mouth, and then chew it, and then reveal it, which is yep. awesome. And so that now is a commercial thing that people can repeat. You know, that I could do, but I, I knew immediately that it was going to be a commercial uh, product uh, just just because of the people that were coming forward uh, with me. So I, I knew that it would be something that um, people would want to do. But I just had to make it that, see, this is the thing. Initially, not many people really liked it because you're, you're doing this. It's a really weird thing. Yeah. But it, it's a prop because people were saying, well, what if they want to, hold it like well I let them hold it but no one has ever no spectator has ever 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 asked to take that home or want it um because it's been in your mouth <laughs> so it's perfect and even it's a more real... now more than ever people yeah want yeah exactly it. exactly but it's perfect for zoom <laughs> um so so yeah we, we got the commercial version um worked out and then I then I performed it in front of um a few magicians at a convention chewing off the sweet because ultimately that's what I wanted to do and uh, after watching me must have been the best part of three and a half four minutes standing there you imagine it can't you all these magicians standing there watching me and I'm chewing this sweet it's not it's not a very pleasant image and that's a lot of time as well so I wanted I wanted a version that I could do quickly in performance and Tom Crosby Bless him, he came up with the idea of, of using a jelly to encase it in jelly. And, and that's that's the, the ultimate version. Um, I've got one here. So this is now the ultimate version of, of the Lolly Hero. So this. Yeah, you, that just looks like a normal lolly. Just that's like Arnold Schwarzenegger in there. You couldn't tell. Not in a million no. years. And you just, yeah. That's yeah. Just that's so cool that's so 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 that was that was created oh and i, I love the whole gag with this flying superman flying around the world <laughs> so that was created really from from nobody else wanting to do it it's really strange so i but but to, to my credit i came up with it make, making it a commercial effect um and it is what it is because of me it wouldn't it wouldn't have been it, it wouldn't have happened well, you know, uh, you, uh, you've continued to create after Lolly Hero as well. I know that uh, last time I probably saw you before the pandemic, you were doing stuff with with Sharpies and Slitherbees, yeah. which was absolutely amazing, and I loved that. And it mm -hmm. was typical high standard. And that was just about to come out, and then lockdown happened. It's visual. I'm really turned on by the visual of things, and so it worked perfectly for Zoom. I mean, Lolly Hero is becoming really popular for Zoom because you can you know, hold it right up. You can do the switch off camera if you want to, or you can do it up here, no one's really seeing. And you can hold it right up to screen and just, just looks incredible. Yeah, it really does, yeah. And people watching Zoom magicians, they want to see the stuff. They don't, they don't want to see you going, yeah, I'm over here. And, oh, well, it could be anything, you know. They, that, this is a good point. So that looks like a lollipop, doesn't it? It does, yeah. So the reveal happens when you do that yeah absolutely. and it's kind of a whoa 
all kind of brought into this magic and it boom so and, and a lot of the stuff you know like a, uh, do you know gum founded yeah uh, <clears throat> sure i've seen you lecture it but yeah you uh, have yeah it's um so gum founded again can you see that as a bit of a yeah. reflection there no, i can see it fine yeah, so it says, it says double mint, but you can you can bring your finger across and right in front of them, right on screen. You can show. That's great. <laughs> and that, that's just just using your fingers again, visual stuff, and and the the um, the Rubik's card that you throw up that that changes, the lolly through. It's all it's all stuff that you can relate to. You don't have to be in person. So because of that. And my my stuff for Extreme Burn, which is Sanders' Extreme Burn, the notes, I think because of that, um, it, it's still popular. And have you continued to create? Are you releasing? The, the question I want to ask yourself is, is there more to come from Steve? Rowe? Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. Can you, give us, can you give us a sneak peek of anything that's <clears throat> coming out? I mean, you don't have to perform it for us. You can just talk us through. Uh, is there yeah, anything I... coming out at some point in the next few? Um, but... Well, the, ne the next stage of Lolly Hero is very much celebrities, recognisable celebrities. Um, I think that's the that's where it needs to go now, uh, because a lot of people again ask me, "Can you do Tom Cruise?" Celebrity reveals reveals in any way are really popular because it's such a great piece of magic to a spectator, and that's why they get such great reaction. Card reveals, you know, like the five of diamonds there or Sharpie reveal, a lollipop reveal, any kind of a reveal that we take for granted, the spectators are blown away by because they don't know about forcing and, you know, how we control what they what they see. And um, so that is the next stage for Lolly Hero, definitely. So that's something to look out for. Um, <clears throat> I've got a prop here. I can show you just the prop. You'll, you'll know yeah. what it is. Um, it's something that I've been working on, still haven't done anything with um because it's a difficult thing because it's really just a prop and it's what you do with it at the end of the day but it's uh, if you imagine you take a, a pier eight and you take the eight ball and then you've got the eight ball here and you squeeze it and then you you can drop it and it becomes a, a oh molded gosh that looks amazing steve and this is all this is all this isn't a sticker this is all inside encased in the in the prop so that's that's a, a thing that i'm working on and have been for a while <laughs> just still not come to fruition with it yeah that's a really nice so you imagine that on an eight ball reveal obviously with a switch but yeah that's that uh, amazing and what i wanted to do i wanted to create a prop that you can hand to a spectator so they're not they're not this is weighted exactly like an eight ball it, it feels the same weight this is within the ball as such there's no ridges it feels like an eight ball if you know what i mean so they're not going to look and go oh yeah it's just a bit of plastic with a sticker it, it's really convincing that that is an eight ball that you've crushed um so that that's something that i'm definitely developing uh, and uh cool. yeah this yeah it's, it's just something I've, I've still not done anything with but there's, there's there's lots of things lots of things like this i've got um I've got another celebrity reveal idea, but it's it's to do with playing cards and you, you smear the pip of a playing card into the celebrity, but I've not got any printed out here. But to, yeah, so you, you take the, the six of spades and smear it and it, and it becomes the, the celebrity face. <laughs> so I'm just kind of, yeah, working on some ideas, yeah. you uh a couple more questions before we finish and, mm -hmm. and the first question is before lockdown you started doing a stage act right it was two of you doing a yeah stage, yeah 
Yeah, uh, myself and Silo, yeah. Yeah, and I'm guessing, obviously, at the moment, that's been put on hold for a bit, but I'm sure it'll come back. There was a big buzz mm. about what you were doing with that act. Like, there was a huge buzz. Everyone was saying, oh, have you seen this? Have you seen this? Have you seen this? Um, I have openly said on this channel that I believe uh, when everything starts to come back to normal, magicians should be working on putting a stage act together. Mm. I think the first thing that's going to come back is stage shows. I think that yeah, or parlor comfortable booking a parlor or a stage magician. Yeah, they would be somebody who's you know. I think that it's going to be a little while before the corporate events with a thousand people shoved in a room like sardines are actually yep. going to be back. And I think that being able to offer a stage show or a parlor show is something that magicians should be working on right now. As somebody that's uh, absolutely that, yeah. yeah, and as somebody. Mm done that and you've 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 made that transition from some somebody who just performed close up to now performing a stage show mm. have any advice on 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 how people can transition to to do that because a lot of close-up magicians are scared to death of working on stage it petrifies them. yeah yeah and and <clears throat> i mean public speaking is not something that i before loved but i can now definitely get in front of hundreds of people and perform and speak very very confidently but it's something that I've built up to so during close-up I started doing I noticed that some of the work that I was performing was drawing a crowd rather than performing to a table or one or two people down here I would perform and then I would look up and there would be 15 people 20 people 30 people all stood watching me perform so I learned that way by the audience is just growing while I was doing close. It was very weird. I, I, I remember the point where I did a wedding and there were 70 people there and the bride and groom were off having their photos taken and they came back and it was literally me with all of the wedding party watching me perform one piece of magic. And, and they came back and said, it's just incredible. It's like watching somebody in West End show or something, you know, they were just all so engrossed in you. And, and it just kind of dawned on me that, that was what I, not necessarily the, the magic that I was performing at that stage, it was kind of my character and my persona was developing that I could handle more and more people and I could control more and more people. And so I learned that way just by expanding uh, my close up magic and table magic as well. W weddings at table magic um, or corporates with table magic when you've got 10 people, when you've got to try and rather than performing to one or two here. <laughs> you've got to engage the whole table at once and and that and that's no different to a hundred people really 10 people if you can if you can project yourself and, and perform to a number of people i think it just feels scary because there's more and obviously you've then got the techie side you've got uh, microphones and you know where people are and that kind of interaction but you learn that as you go along so for me with, with Sila, who we've been doing the stage so stuff with, I, I started doing a lot more table work at um, corporates and weddings. I started upselling that, uh, performing to the room. So I would I would say, look, I can, I can do your drinks reception and your breakfast, but I'll also do a performance to the whole room. And I was kind of, I was upselling it and initially not charging any more because I really wanted to do it. I really wanted that experience. And so I would do that. I would just do, just do one, one piece, but it would involve the groom or it would involve the father of the bride. It would involve somebody, but it'd be one piece where I was then getting some experience, some stage experience from effectively a close-up gig. Um, and then restaurant work, I started uh, early on, I started performing in restaurants um, and that was just invaluable to me. Every Saturday and Sunday, I would perform in local restaurant, only a couple of hours, um, but again, it would be two tables. Um, and then and then they had an area where um, you could book 15 people and they would sit and then it would be a show it would start to be a show that I was doing. So ju just through different environments, I started to develop my my stage persona. And then Sila came to me and wanted to do something on a on a monthly basis. And we started to do the shows in Berkhamsted, which was um, to sort of 60 people. But it's great because we would perform close up magic to them. They would already warm to us and then we would perform stage. So it was less, less scary because they knew me already. But I then built up, I, I can now go in a room of people that I don't know and perform on stage quite comfortably because I've kind of developed it 
as I've gone along. So it's been a gradual process. I, I didn't just jump in and do it, but I think there are opportunities wherever you're performing. If you're performing live, there are opportunities to learn stagecraft and, and Zoom you can learn, we were talking earlier on, you treat Zoom like a stage show, so do yep. I. I treat it like a stage show. Um, I, don't, I don't have cameras that look down on, on decks of cards or anything like that. I treat it as a, a performance and I project myself to the screen. Yep. Zoom is perfect for that. Zoom is perfect for learning to do that, I think, as well. Because at the moment, obviously, you can't, we can't go out and do close-up work uh, and, and develop it that way. Completely agree with you. And what made you decide to do it as a two-person act. The reason I ask is because way back in <coughs> my career, when I started to do stage shows, I formed a two-person act with a guy called Russell, uh, who, yep. no one, who no Russell one, Leeds. Yeah, Russell Leeds. He's, 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 yep. He hasn't been in magic for years, but the reason that we put that two-person act together is because both of us were scared to death of performing on stage. <laughs> and it was kind of a case of, if we do it together, maybe you know we'll have more confidence. And, and that mm. was why I formed the two person show. Uh, uh, okay, so 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 what we've got isn't a two person show. It's not a two person act as such. We don't perform necessarily magic together. Mm. What we do is we use each other to help in in the presentation. So uh, I I um I might ask somebody to shuffle some cards and then I'll hand them to Sila and get him to shuffle them as well, where you know he would do a switch. So I'm using him yep. as a utility and he's using me. Or if he if he wants to get an audience member up, I will go to the audience member and bring them in, that kind of thing. So but we would start using each other. There's a there's a great, a great trick that I do where I show a bunch of cards and um the audience know that they've all got me on them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the spectator that, that's um, chosen thinks that they're all different. I get Sila to shuffle them up and, and he changes them to all pictures of him. And I'm, <laughs> But I'm supposed to not know that. So I don't know that. And the audience think that I don't know that he's changed them. So it's bringing the audience into the act as well by the way that we interact with each other. So I, I think, so it's not necessarily a, a double act where we're performing you know, metamorphosis together, but we, we, so he, he does the, the invisible bullet catch. I don't know if you've seen that, but he, it's a, a great routine that he came up with. Yeah. He did it um, on uh, Romania's Got Talent, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic routine. So I would go round to the audience to show them the invisible bullet. So I, I, while he stood there, I can move around the audience to show them the invisible bullet and give it to the spectator. So I'm, it's not, necessarily a double act as such but we we interweave our own personalities within each other's act got you if that makes sense so uh, we can he can perform without me and i can perform without him but when we perform together there is there is an atmosphere and an electricity that people do say you two you know you work really well together but i think we work to go together well like that two individuals that kind of yeah yeah, that totally makes sense. That totally makes sense. And it's really great advice. You know, I, I really do think that people should be following your example and going and working on stage, especially now. Yeah, um, it's so fun. It, and and I, I wanted to do it. I wanted to go to the biggest sort of stage um, because of the challenge. And you have to think about things completely different. It's something new to learn. And, I, and it, is, it is now an upsell. You know, if somebody does a wedding, I can upsell. Um, some magic to the whole room and it's, it's a nice added bonus but I, I just really do love it amazing i want to ask you one final question and this is a question okay. I ask every single person i interview and it, 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 <laughs> it's a question that definitely relates to you what's next okay. i mean you've got so many facets to your career as a magician you mm. uh, you know you're a creator you run gimmick king you're creating magic mm. Uh, you're working with different companies producing magic you're a mm. performer you you have you are always in demand as a close-up magician um uh, and also as a stage magician you've got your your show that you do with Sila, and you've only been doing this for 10 years if you stopped right now <laughs> people would remember if you never performed again people would remember steve rowe for oh, a very you. very 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 long time your your legacy That's very kind of you my friend it's true you're you know <clears throat> 
there's, there's magicians that have been that got into magic at the age of six that are now 60 or 70 years old that haven't even done half of what you've managed to achieve and mm. you know it's it's incredible to think that 10 years ago you had no mm. work knowledge of magic and yet in 10 years seeing what you've achieved is brilliant and i spoke to doc eason recently and he talked about him doing the same thing and he didn't get into magic until his late 30s and look mm. what achieved. So my question is, what's next? Because I know you're not going to slow down. Let's assume that the pandemic goes away at some point. Yeah. Um, where is your focus? Are you wanting to just do more performing? Or are you wanting to uh, focus on gimmick king? Uh, I, I, I love it all. I, I, I love it all. What? what... Yeah, I, I love performing. Absolutely love it. And I think that's, that's the thing. If you took one thing away, if you took performing away, I'd be distraught. If you took creating products away, I wouldn't be as distraught. If you took stage performing away, I wouldn't be as distraught. It's the close-up magic is definitely my my thing. But I love it all. I love I love creating because I do it for myself. Um I love I love obviously it's nice when other people want to buy your product and and but if if the shop ceased, I I would would still carry on with magic. It's it's the performance performing side of things so wherever that takes me i may produce another 20 things in the next year i may produce nothing i'm not chasing that i'm not worried about whether that's going to happen or not i kind of let things happen uh, and i let my myself my energy naturally form into whatever it might be for me not necessarily for the financial side of things so i think performing that's that's my thing um long may it continue uh the other stuff don't know don't know i love it but and is it is what it is on your magical bucket list that you haven't done yet that you want to do you know you talked about entering competitions is that something you want to do more of or is there any no no i i i would <laughs> i don't i'm not sure it's ever going to happen but i would love to have a really good stage act that i could take places um but i i don't know i'd love that i'd love that but i i i, I know you're, you're talking about my creativity and individuality and everything i um you talk about the likes of ben hart and and faye presto they for me are way way beyond anything that i could possibly comprehend so when I see them, I aspire to, to something that, that they are. Um, and if I never get there, it doesn't matter. It's the chase that's the fun thing. Yeah. That's fantastic. That is absolutely brilliant. Unbelievable. <sighs> I knew that this was going to be a great interview, and it has been an amazing interview, my friend. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Well, thank you for asking me. It's, it's been a pleasure. It's, uh, yeah, it's always nice to chat to friends. Absolutely, absolutely. And I can't wait for all of this to go back to normal and yeah. I get to see you at another convention and spend lots of money on <laughs> you've got because some crazy thing. See you because <laughs> it's always some crazy off the ball bonkers <laughs> idea that not anybody else would have come I'll up with. I'll get that sorted by then. You can see hey, it in person. <laughs> I need that in my life. I need that in my life. It's only magicians that would go, yeah, I need a squished up eight ball in yeah. my life. I need that. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> awesome steve thank you so much and once again down below the gimmick king yes the gimmick king it's going to be flashing up on the screen there'll be a link in the description go check out uh, like i said there's a lot of people that watch this internationally will you ship all over the world is that something yeah absolutely say? yeah yeah obviously uh shipping over the world it takes a little bit longer at the minute um but yes uh, i can obviously do that uh, yeah and yeah and, and i do do that i mean all my products are, are popular over in the us as well so yeah perfect so support steve he is one of the good guys in magic and uh and once again steve thank you oh so oh yeah i've got i've got another story very quickly can i tell it please do because <clears throat> it's about it's a, again about how things how i've created stuff and it just came to me when i was talking about uh, america extreme burn <clears throat> so for years everyone was performing it with the lottery tickets weren't they yeah. yeah, in the UK this is, yeah, because we have the problem with the notes changing. Um, the way the way that uh, I came up with the idea of kids' notes for Extreme Burn was in one of my restaurants. So 
I was changing blank paper to real notes in one of my restaurants. And, um, you know, sometimes you go in restaurants and they have like things that they can color in and stuff. Yeah. You know, like pictures they can color in. We didn't have yep. that. And this family were completely bored. They didn't know what they were going to do. And I could see that the parents were getting a little bit irate and the, the kids were just, you know, all over the place. They needed something. And, and the food was going to come out. And I was already concentrating on some other tables to go to. And I thought, well, I don't want to go to them and perform some magic. Um, what can I do? So what I did, I gave them the blank pieces of Tyvek and a pen each. And they drew banknotes on these Tyvek. And then I took them back. And when I performed to them, I changed them back into real notes. And then I changed them back and gave them their, their hand-drawn notes. So again, that was just a story that I remember now. That's how I came up with the idea of hand-drawn notes uh, to real notes with Richard Sanders' Extreme Burn. It's one of my most popular things is because people love that premise. And again, it's a really nice thing to be able to do in front of people. One Sorry about that. So no, one thing <laughs> I'm seeing from this is be open for inspiration hitting you at any point. You say that you don't <laughs> sit down and yeah. create magic and yeah, yeah, yeah. you're always yeah. coming up with things. But it mm. seems from what you've told me on this interview, it's not that you're sitting there trying to come up with the ideas. No, 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 absolutely not. Yeah. yeah. And what, what I find quite ironic about the whole thing is that you are right. The kids' car, the kids' um, notes is something that you're very well known for. And as you know, I've got a couple of sets of those as well. And the guy <laughs> that got you back into magic was famous for kids cards where there were playing <laughs> yes. cards that yes true that turned, it's almost like you've come full circle yeah yeah and i wasn't even aware of kids cards at the time at all somebody actually said to me um one, once that the popularity of the, the hand drawn notes had come out do you, do you know which one is kids cards and, and i didn't know i didn't realize didn't recognize that richard pinner was that guy and, until a bit later on so yeah it's uh, strange it is a funny it is it is a funny old world isn't it absolutely yeah 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 but i think you've got to look don't look for inspiration inspiration kind of comes to you i think that's the thing that's really great advice and you know hopefully people that have watched this interview will find their creativity and find their inspiration and everything that you've shared with us has been invaluable steve it really has if people Thank want you. to speak to you if magicians that have watched this want to reach out and speak to you yeah uh, please well, for people communicating with you and absolutely yeah of course yeah yeah yeah. what's the best way to get yeah. in touch with you is it through the, the gimmick king and by email or is it social media what's yeah if, you, if you're hooked up with me on social media then obviously steve Rowe. um my personal account that's fine or uh, info at the gimmick king is my email address perfect reach out to steve he is absolutely one of the good guys in magic and an amazing creator steve thank you again one more time it's my pleasure you are brilliant guys uh, make sure you stick around. I'm going to be back again tomorrow with another video. Uh, and uh, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. If you want to see more videos like this, like the video and leave a comment down below because I'm sure Steve will read them. And uh, it's always nice leaving comments on these videos. So one more time, Steve, thank you very much. And My God, pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I will see you.